Welcome back to the Now Morning Show. I am Kimberly D'Souza and I'm so happy to be in your company. It is Wednesday. We're over the hump and we're already into the weekend. Um, well, from November uh, 25th to December 10th, we're actually commemorating 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And with me, I have the director of the counter-trafficking unit at the Ministry of National Security. I have uh, Miss Alana Wheeler. Good morning, Miss Wheeler. Good morning, Kimberly, <laughs> and good morning to the listeners and the viewers. And Miss Wheeler will actually be talking to us about some counter-trafficking um, support uh, that the ministry is actually giving to women against gender-based violence mm -hmm. and also against human trafficking, yes? Yes. All right, so let's jump right into it. What exactly uh, is the counter-trafficking unit at the Ministry of National Security? What do you do? What projects are you currently working on? Yes, well, I know that some of our PSAs would have aired on TTT. I've seen them a few times, uh, but just for the viewers this morning, the counter-trafficking unit is a unit established under the Trafficking in Persons Act and it is under the Ministry of National Security. So we report directly to the Permanent Secretary and the Minister of National Security. Uh, we are civilian led. However, we are multi-agency. So we have police officers who work in the unit. Uh, we also have immigration officers and other civilian staff who work at the unit. So we are responsible. We have a very large mandate mm -hmm. for a very small team of I persons imagine, yes. and a very small and a very dedicated team of persons and officers, I must say, and I really want to commend them for all of the great work that they have done over the years. Uh, we basically coordinate the government's response to human trafficking, but we also coordinate the national response. And the national response means we have to work with NGOs, um, faith-based organizations, private sector, internationals, and other government agencies. So it's a very, very, very large mandate. And uh, we have done all the best that we can do um, with the resources that we have. I, say, I could say we have done miracles with very little. Can you tell us about some of those miracles? Like what are some <laughs> of the projects <laughs> that, yeah. uh, that actually are done in the unit? Yeah, well, so, um, so far we've done two um, testimonies. We have recorded an audio testimony of a child victim of trafficking. And we have been using that to raise awareness over the years. We have gone to schools as far as South, Tobago, East, West, North. Well, that was pre-COVID. And we would have gone sharing that um, child's testimony and also sharing it with police officers when we train them so that they will understand what a victim of trafficking has actually been through. Uh, this year, we did one a bilingual testimony of a Venezuelan migrant, a 17-year-old girl who was um, smuggled into Trinidad and Tobago for the purpose of being trafficked. And she was recruited via Facebook. Right, so, so we've done those two things, raising awareness. We've also done a lot of work with the NGOs, with Children's Arc. We did an anti-child trafficking campaign. We've um, published those six new PSAs, which are very short. They're educational, and they can be aired on any television or radio station. And we've done a lot of training with police and different frontline agencies. So during the 16 days of activism, we have done four days of training with police officers in the police divisions. Because uh, you're well aware that, um, you know, vulnerability and, and migrants and persons who are subject to being exploited are in every police division. Just as trafficking is everywhere in the world, um, it's in every part of Trinidad and Tobago, it's unfortunately. You know, so it means that the police officers, uh, when persons walk into the stations or when they call the hotlines, those officers have to be able to detect if this is a possible trafficking case and refer it to the counter trafficking unit. So we did some training with them and we produced a pocket guide, which you would see on the table here displayed. Um, it fits in the purse for our, us ladies. It fits in the back pocket for the men or the front pocket. And it's basically a small manual that gives them little tips on what to look for. We even have some expressions in Spanish that they can ask Spanish speaking persons um, if they need help. So that um, pocket guide was produced and we've shared it with the frontline officers. We continue to do the training with the frontline officers though. Um, we did some training with the International Organization for Migration, which is one of our partners. And we did over 80 government employees last week um, to also again um, sensitize them and raise awareness. Uh, the frontline persons are the key persons. Frontline persons, even our medical persons, doctors, nurses, um, persons at security guards, even here in the station. Uh, you have persons who may be interacting with members of the public and they may come into contact and they may see things that may look like a possible trafficking case, a possible red flag. Uh, when you walk in the malls, when you go in the groceries, victims are everywhere and perpetrators are everywhere. Uh, some of them may be even in our workplaces and we aren't aware of it. 
So basically what we have done is really to um, educate on raising red flags. And as I said, we have done miracles with very little. So uh, we multiply uh, in, you know, we find creative ways to multiply the little resources that we have. Now, Ms. Wheeler, um, at the risk of going a bit too psychological, can you spot, how do you mm. know the signs of a victim? Like what are the signs somebody would show? Because people may want to hide it, right? They might be too scared of speaking right. out and that sort of thing. How can you know a victim or spot a victim? Yeah. Well, when we look in the school system, um, we know once children are back out of school, uh, you find that children who have a very high level of absenteeism from school, and I must say it's a combination of several things. It isn't just one thing. Um, children who have come from very abusive homes, or they tend to run away a lot. Uh, children who may have been um, abused in some way or are subjected to incest or any type of sexual abuse or psychological abuse, they tend to be very vulnerable. Uh, you find that, for example, children who may all of a sudden have an older boyfriend or girlfriend, because it happens to boys also, um, suddenly you find that there's a change in the items that they have. So whereas you know that their income or their family income can't afford them or allow them to have certain items like iPhones and tablets and um, designer sneakers and all these different things. And you find suddenly that child all of a sudden has gotten these things and there is no justifiable reason. Then that's a red flag that somebody is providing those things to that child. And um, so because, you know, you're talking about grooming, there's so many things you could talk about with the gender-based violence. The gender-based violence isn't just physical violence. And uh, we tend to always look at it as, well, gender-based violence is intimate partner or it's just somebody beating up somebody else. Um, gender-based violence, when we talk about human trafficking, is very much psychological. It's psychological, it's mental, it's emotional, and it's spiritual. So the scars, you won't see physical scars necessarily, right? What you would see is what, what is on the inside and what's going on with that person. And there is that control that takes place that is not physical chains that has the person bound, but it's psychological and emotional chains that has them bound, where that person feels a sense of obligation and they have no choice but to remain in that situation. You know, we often ask, well, why do domestic violence victims remain in this situation? Why don't they just leave? And a lot of times it's because there's something that, that chains them to that abuser. Now, talking about the abuser, how do you spot, because you said something chilling where, you know, the, the uh, perpetrator might actually be somebody who you're working with, somebody who you know personally. How can you tell if, you know, somebody in your workplace or somebody who you know might be a perpetrator of uh, human trafficking or even gender-based violence? Yes. The perpetrators is very difficult to know the perpetrators. It's a challenge to know the perpetrators. Um, but, I mean, I think you, in conversation with them, you would know certain things, maybe the activities that they're engaging in and um, probably lifestyles that they have. Because when we look at um, traffickers, it's about profit. So when you see uh, an individual working, you would have a sense of what their income is like. And you would know, well, this person, with the income they have, I don't think they can afford these things and that and that. And then you, you know, you could pry, do some more prying, and you realize, well, there's another source of income or other sources of income. And if that person you find, um, you may see them moving around a lot um, with, you know, women, different women and stuff, if we're talking about prostitution, and that means they may be grooming or they may be having certain women that work for them and things like that. So, you know, you really look at the person's lifestyle to really determine um, what exactly they're engaging in, what's happening in the closets, you know, what's happening behind closed doors, what's happening at night after hours. Um, now that the curfew has lifted and everything, it means that, you know, um, all these open activities have, have resumed. Mm -hmm. Um, though during the COVID period and the lockdowns, they would have taken place clandestinely. Now, as we move into COVID, I mean, has um, how many cases are you seeing cases increasing now, now that we're in the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, we have had a lot more referrals, um, even though the, um, you know, with the trafficking, it became more challenging to detect it. Because whereas, you know, you would go to a physical location and identify as somebody who's exploited in a restaurant or a bar or somewhere, um, now a lot of the recruitment and grooming is taking place online. So because everybody's online now, right? I mean, I'm just happy to be in person in studio. I was telling you earlier because yeah. it's like, wow, everything is virtual. And this is like, uh, you know, it's good to see you face to face. Um, and, you know, that interaction is so important because you are able to pick up on so many more things as opposed to someone who is just behind a screen. So a lot of the activity was virtual during the COVID period. But however, we've worked with the TTPS Cyber and Social Media Unit 
and we've also worked with some other specialized units to be able to really um, zero in and detect on some of those recruitment um, websites and social media pages. Uh, we still have got more referrals, um, believe it or not, from a lot of the police divisions and the stakeholder agencies. The NGOs are doing tremendous work on the ground. Um, they are in the communities and they have direct interaction with persons who are victims. So we have gotten referrals. We have had persons contacting us in Spanish language and we've had persons contacting us um, through the hotline and directly um, you know, through the different persons that work in the unit. No, so, Ms. Wheeler, yeah. um, mm -hmm. sorry, but um, I want to get some data, some stats. Mm -hmm. What, how, 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 what, what are the figures like and have they increased from um, 2019, 2020, 2021 to now in terms of human trafficking cases and even in terms of gender-based violence, if you can speak to yes. that? On average, before 2019, we would have had an average of about 13 victims identified per year. Human trafficking? Or human gender? trafficking right. victims, yes. Um, and just to, um, to, to clarify, human trafficking is considered a type of gender-based violence. Mm. Yes, it is considered a type. As I said, we don't hear much about that. We hear about domestic violence and all of that. But it is a type of gender-based violence. And when you look at the UN women and how they define it, uh, they define it as any type of abuse against an individual where that person is denied of their rights. You know, so it's all about a violation of that person's rights. And human trafficking, in definition, is a violation of an individual's rights. Their freedom of movement, freedom of choice, and freedom of being able to, to choose even the type of work they do and who their clientele are. So, so, you know, so we talk about all of that. So on average, 13 persons, victims identified pre-2019. Um, 2019, we, at that year in particular, we identified about 40, 40 to 50 victims were identified, mainly women and girls. So we're seeing a trend where even with the general gender-based violence, where the statistics say one in every three women um, one in every three victims, sorry, are women and girls. With the victims of trafficking, you find that the majority of the victims are women and girls. And we found the majority aging from as young as age 14 to as old as 45, 50 years of age. And we found women and girls of all types, university students, um, mature women who have adult children, young, young girls, teenagers, um, very educated, very intelligent young girls. So it's not, it's, it, trafficking isn't limited to any particular type or profile of a victim. You or I can be trafficked because it's all about being deceived. You know, it's all about being deceived and it's all about meeting a particular need that that person has or a vulnerability that that person has. And you know, as women and girls, you know, we tend to, you know, they say we are the softer gender, but we are, um, men also have vulnerabilities there, eh? but well, I was women. I just about to ask about that in yes. terms of the, the trafficking numbers. Uh, uh, the, I think you mentioned 40 last year or 40 years yeah, before. No, Were any of them males? Um, not in that year, but okay. we have had male victims. Okay. And most of the male victims have been for labor exploitation, which meant they would have been exploited in businesses like um, you know, small businesses, yes. security industry, um, those types of businesses. So yes, men are vulnerable. And you find also migrants are vulnerable, particularly irregular migrants. Um, when you look at the whole migration process and an individual leaving their home, leaving their country to go to another country for a better life at the end of the day, um, sometimes they don't know what they will meet at that place because it's a level of desperation um, that that person has. It means that their country was not able to provide for them the life that they wanted to have. So they've decided to move on to another country, um, wishing and hoping that things would be better. And then to arrive and then be taken advantage of, because at the end of the day, the trafficking is really about um, exploiting the vulnerability of yes. a person. And if you are irregular or illegal, if you have entered illegally, if you have overstayed your time, if you never entered with any travel documents or anything, um, if you have broken any of the laws in the land, all those things make you vulnerable. If you have no money, you have no place to sleep, nowhere to live, no food to eat. If you're pregnant, you're even more vulnerable. If you have young children, you're even more vulnerable. And, you know, um, so women, we would more understand those things. So now, Ms. Wheeler, um, mm -hmm. just a quick question, because I know we have to wrap soon. What mm -hmm. are the nationalities of some of these um, victims yes. that are human trafficked? Over 80% are Venezuelan nationals. Mm -hmm. We have had Colombian nationals, women and girls. We've had from the Dominican Republic from Guyana and also from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We've also had Indian nationals who've been exploited for labor um, and they, incidentally, most of them are exploited by their own persons. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's a reality that we have. So, so the statistics and the data, uh, we have seen, as I said, more cases coming in and more referrals. We've seen more children, mm -hmm. unaccompanied and separated uh, children, migrant children 
falling prey to being victims of trafficking because again there is a level of desperation mm -hmm. they are economic migrants seeking a better life and um, they end up being exploited now miss wheeler we're out of time but final thoughts before we wrap any final mm -hmm. thing you want to just tell the community about you know what to look mm -hmm. out for how they can reach the ministry that sort of thing yeah, sure. I just want to thank you, Kimberly, for having us on this program. Um, very short and just to uh, say to the community, you know, look out for the red flags. There are people reaching out to you and just look for the signs. You can check out our social media handles, Counter Trafficking Unit TT. We are on YouTube, Facebook, uh, we're on Instagram, we are on all, all the, the social socials. media. <laughs> but it's Counter Trafficking Unit TT. And we also have our hotline, 800-4288-4CTU. You can call us directly and we will respond appropriately. Miss Wheeler, thank you so, so much. We had to condense all of that in about 12 to 15 minutes, but I thank you so much for what you did. I think uh, mm -hmm. we all thank you. The public knows a bit more about counter-trafficking and human trafficking, especially mm -hmm. as we are looking at gender-based violence right now. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me again. And thank you so mm -hmm. much for staying on the Now Morning Show. As you know, we're going to take a break, but stay with us. We'll be right back. Nearer to me than all the stars.